Alright computer, let's hook up to the local GNET hub and get this show on the road. Initiating connection to Jupiter GNET hub. Connection to Jupiter GNET hub established. Okay, computer, open up comms to all our viewers and begin transmitting our latest file. Transmitting John and the Space Boat. Bending Rock. IMS Space Boat slid out of hyperspace on a near perfect exit vector in the outskirts of Kavor's system. Even out of sensor reach, the giant asteroid colony CAV could clearly be seen on her optics. The hollowed out terraformed asteroid was one of many, cavernous settlements of different sizes, those were dotted all over fringe space. It was far easier, quicker, and best of all, cheap to build yourself a home inside of an asteroid. If CAV was any different from any other space rocks, it was its size and perhaps the peculiar, now famous overall Terran G-Net shape that made it stick out from the rest. Hundreds of tiny flickering lights, each representing a starship, orbited its near pear-shaped surface. Some probably waited for docking clearance, others had just left its spaceport and were maneuvering away. Their navigators plotted either direct hyperspace jumps or a course towards the nearest wormhole. Not everyone was willing or had the means to outfit their vessel with a hyperspace engine. Most cargo or transport ships use the much cheaper FTL alternative, gate drive. In the beginning, John explored many colonies and other locations throughout Terran space by hitchhiking. That was only after he'd travel over most of the solar system with his solar boat, while recording everything and then uploading it on GNET. Was that why the bulk of his subscribers voted to name the new starship to be Spaceboat and not something else? Barely able to pull his eyes from the beauty that was Cav and the fluttering around its lights, John finally blinked then looked around the bridge. No wonder he felt strange during the hyperspace jump. Besides him and Eve, the ship was empty. With only two cabins occupied, the mess was silent and void of cheer. The longer his voyage lasted, the gloomier John felt. He needed to swim, immerse himself in a place full of other people to no longer feel isolated again. Hyperspace was a great way to move around, but some people were wrought with melancholia after one or another too long a trip. The best way to fight space sickness was having constant contact with other sentient beings. Since in most cases, while you traveled through hyperspace, access to GNET was impossible. Unless, of course, one of your vessels perfectly followed a hyperspace comm line. Most spaceships carried at least five crew or passengers. You could try to supplement people with VI software, but that... That's not nearly the same. Not quite real. John swiped one of the old nav files from his PDA to Spaceboat's navigation pit. Its mainframe projected the enlarged map, pinpointing everything he just uploaded, projecting another course for him. Flying mostly by computer assist is not something he liked, but until John discovered a navigator, that was how things were going to be. Hey, are we changing course? chimed Eve, after she entered the bridge and quickly noted that the ship was veering slightly away from its pre-planned destination. No, oh, I was planning on showing you one of my favorite spots, Eve, remember? John pointed at the hollow note projected on their main screen and stated after hungrily gulping, The Vending Rock is a place not nearly enough visited, yet I aim to change this with my latest streams. What? You mean food or beverage vending machines? Is this small rock like a factory or something? 
Eve leapt behind the comms console, her faster-than-lightning paws dancing over its controls once more. There are very few mentions of this place on the local and even Terran G-Net. Even if you find something, it will probably be some boring forum post or a few grainy huddle slides. Maybe a short vid. He sighed and then poked the hollow, enlarging his four, or was it five, star-year-old handwritten note. See here? The coordinates were given to me by another hitchhiker I befriended. An alien by the name Zola. Zola? It does not sound very fringe space-like, John. Star blood from one of the faraway allied star states, maybe? I don't know. Eve did project her quick genet search, yet, true to John's words, it did uncover little in the way of more and newer relevant information about the vending asteroid. No, oh, he's from one of the star states which first allied with the Kalor Empire, the Kel. John punched in the activation command after his ship's mainframe finalized its navigation calculations. Slowly, the vessel approached the tiny rock, and after docking codes were exchanged between it and the spaceboat, the obscure location conquered the main screen. Interesting. I've never met a Kel before. They're supposed to be quite rare. Is it true that they can see spirits of those who still no longer, or had never, slept? The eyes. Are the eyes? Eve's many questions seemingly floated in the air, while the two mainframes carefully piloted the spaceship ever closer to one of the asteroid's landing arms. John smiled, and seconds after the spaceboat's airlocks was successfully locked with the docking port, pointed his own rolled-up eyes, saying, Milky white, and they do see even the spookiest of ghosts. Hey, his head suddenly turned around. What's this? Where? What is it? What did you see? Slightly startled, Eve's paw got ever closer to her sidearm. Over yonder, I can see a big... Boo! John burst out laughing. Ha ha ha. Very funny, John. Ears somewhat drooped, sarcastically clapped her paws. She then tapped the holster and made a gun with her paw, before stating, I got a particle beam pistol here, trophy from my militia service. Ghosties can get shot too, you know, if we scan them with proper sensors or see them. Grinning, Eve pointed at the asteroid and asked, Are you sure this rock is, like, apparition clean? Pretty much, yeah. The owner's an old spacer. His grandkids probably play here, and I sincerely doubt that anything bad could happen to us. There are probably a whole bunch of special sensors and alarms installed just in case, so... John pointed at her holster, and his look darted from it to Eve's militia shoulder patch. Can I ask you about it? Victorious F-32, Tarzarian-issued particle beam pistol. One of their really good ones. Wanna see? The bunny pulled out her trophy weapon from its holster and, after removing the power pack, offered it to John. He held it for a while, examining the rough yet ergonomic design and aimed through its glow sights. As all things made by the Tazarian Imperium, this gun, too, carried an ominous air around it. A civilian, John nevertheless had self-defense training and recognized some of its features. The sights were replaced, probably by its new owner. New heat sinks installed, and the gun fitted with an attachment which allowed it to accept longer power packs. To his liking, the gun was not. He very much preferred the Nambu for its light construction and durability. This thing, however, fired a different type of beam, and though Terran lasers were superior by the way of energy consumption and heat management, particle guns had their uses. He gave Eve her weapon back and observed how quickly the ex-militia ops specialist loaded, then holstered it. Not a word of how she came into possession of said pistol left her snout, however. They walked slowly out through the bridge doors, and after performing a mundane spacesuit check at the equipment room, entered the airlock. Gravity plating was probably set to two-thirds of Earth's standard because they instantly felt significantly lighter. 
Walking down the corridor, which led deeper inside, John pointed to Eve the many colorful murals and hollow art decorating its walls. Some were just spacer doodles, signs that one or another clan had visited the place. Others, copies of vintage advertisements from Old Earth or Mars, Luna, even Mercury. The corridor ended before a gate on which, now smiling Eve read, Please, leave the place better than you found it. Leave some of your rations in place of what you ate. Others might not be as lucky as you are. This is a spacer vending machine food court, said John, while waving his PDA over a nearby sensor, and after a click, the door gently slid into the walls. Before them lay a commodious room, its six walls lined with all sorts of old spaceship ration cooking machines. Taken from the early days of space exploration vessels, these were built from large cargo or mining vessels, whose crews had often no time or lacked the space to cook meals. Space MRE, or meal ready to eat type ration packs, were self heating, sealed, and came with a straw. One you used to suck said meal from its polyplastic container or tube, since in those days spaceships had no floor plating. And often crews spent months, years in semi to zero G environment, developed health issues, or received high doses of radiation. In those old rations, there were certain medical additives put there so that the precious lives of these hardworking people could be protected. Yet after all the processing and adding meds, the food tasted like medicine or outright rancid. Thankfully, soon after their first few years in space, new technologies were adopted, like artificial gravity or floor plating and energy shields. John picked one of the vending machines and pointed it to Eve. See this one? It was manufactured after New Year's of 1959 by the Bronco Company. Super rare to find one anywhere these days. Best of all, the burgers you can buy from it are made from the following original Bronco Plasma Burger recipe. Patties made from Martian buffalo, pickles grown from Luna's vast hydroponics, and the bun is real Saharan rye. The machine looked like a big, hilariously grinning, triple-layered burger. After a second look, one could recognize its bulky, primitive stasis unit, sticking out from underneath the polyplastic outer shell. Eve's eyes had already scouted another vending machine, and she hopped quickly, rummaging through her pockets looking for one credit coin. She found one, and with childlike glow in her eyes, explored the vending machine's tall shapes. Its big, tired gorilla-like construction was yet another rare sight these days. It was a root beer dispenser, and not just any mundane brand, but Frothing Kong. Something almost any kid drank by the case, if they could get enough money to buy them, of course. Both exchanged another look, and John tossed her two coins. One Kong with extra space spice for me. Do you like plasma burger with extra hot goo or the normie stuff? After depositing the two crystalline metal etched credit coins, the bunny punched two of the gorilla's teeth. The machine then sang one really catchy 16 bit melody the second she made her selection, and Eve snickered. One after another, two chilled perfection bottles of Kong soda rolled from its dispenser, and she snatched them with eager paws. Boss, do I look like a normie? Super hot goo for this bunny. Is it one cred or... John had already poked the machine's control buttons, made his and Eve's selection, deposited the one coin per burger, plus one more for the special hot sauce. Just as all kids from his generation remembered it, virtually all treats, soda, candy, everything cost one cred coin. He just pointed at his holocam, which was not yet activated, and asked, If you want, tell everybody the story of your beam gun and how it fell into your paws. The machine comically burped, then whined about these burgers being too hot for it to vend. Yet another wacky 16-bit sound, which sated John's hunger for more nostalgic pre-1969 invasion memorabilia and food. 
It beeped, and he carefully pulled out of its dispenser a platter with their steaming hot burgers. In case it's something you want to keep to yourself, let's eat. I'll set up the camera. You prep the links, ops officer. John sat on one of the nearby tables, which still had boot and food platter locks, leftovers from the olden pre-artificial gravity days, and reached for the Kong soda. All right. I'll tell you the story, but after we finish streaming. Eve's voice fluttered a bit, and she unwrapped her burger. Immediately, the aroma of really, really hot sauce hit John like a hammer in the nose. Universe. <coughs> Greetings. <coughs> Everyone, and welcome to <coughs> Cavs Outskirts. We are right now visiting one of the best secret vending machine spots I know of. Coordinates are in the streams description provided by in real time by my new assistant Evelyn, mistress of GNet linking and computer specialist extraordinaire. And also <laughs> apparently a lover of super spicy foods. He reached for his opened, aggressively fizzing Kong soda and placed it in the frame. His hand still holding the half-wrapped, piping hot plasma burger, after successfully defeating the urge to drink first, he smiled and took one big, juicy bite. Okay, computer, that's it. Disconnect from the local GNET hub and set course for Kavora. Disconnecting GNET. Setting course, Kavora. Schooling engines now. Initiating. Jumping in three, two, one.